Good evening, everyone, and welcome to PCA's Garage. I hope you're having a wonderful holiday. This is Tech Tactics Live, episode 63, and today we have Confessions of a Porsche Salesman. Before I introduce our guests, I want to remind you to please like and subscribe and comment. We're trying to get to 100 thousand subscribers each and every one of you that are watching you can make a difference so just click that subscriber bell or subscribe button and of course we want to thank our sponsor Pirelli without their support none of this would happen uh, let's go straight into meeting our guests to my left here you've seen them before our jovial PCA technical director Manny Alvin <laughs> does that mean fat <laughs> 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 and our special, special guest, uh, someone that was named uh, top 100 salesman worldwide. He's sold Porsches in Georgia, Virginia, Colorado, Maryland, worked with the likes of Brian Redman, Hurley Haywood, Chick Stanton, five years, I believe, at Brumos, and more importantly, almost a 40-year PCA member. Mike Maurer, welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Boo, really. Almost 40 years, seems oh, like a here, week or so. Here, 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 here. That's, that's amazing. As a Porsche club member, time flies when you're having fun. There right. you go. Well, that's what we hope to do tonight is to have some fun. We kind of you know, toyed with the title a little bit. We're not really doing confessions. We're not going to be saying anything. And I think you wanted to kind of address that. Yes, there are no confessions. Or everything is up front. Yes, everything is up front. Um, but you, you have... You've, you've been able to see the, the, the Porsche environment from a, a different perspective than Manny and I, right? We're on the customer side and you're, you're on the, the sales side, on the manufacturer side. And that's what I was hoping you know, t tonight's session would be all about is sharing some of that insight that you have that we don't necessarily see. And I guess we'll start with, you know, let, let's, go, let's go through the agenda of what we're gonna be talking about today. We're gonna be talking about how did you become a Porsche salesman? And I know mm -hmm. someone on our live chat here uh, was talking about maybe they're thinking of adding that to their third or fourth career. Um, we're gonna talk about, uh, can you give folks that are buying a new Porsche or pre-owned Porsche some advice? Is there room for negotiating when purchasing a Porsche? Mm -hmm. Allocation, allocation. Uh, Manny, how many times do you get a call about allocations? Several times. <laughs> <laughs> So the ins and outs of allocations, hopefully you can share with us that. And then the common mistakes that you've seen over the years when people, where people have uh, done or made during their purchase of a Porsche. So we're gonna, we're gonna of course, also look at the live chat and we're gonna, I'm gonna feed some questions here. Manny's, Manny has come up with a great list of questions. We only have an hour and I know we have probably four hours worth of content, <laughs> but we're gonna, we're gonna keep rolling. So first and foremost, how in the world did you end up selling Porsches? A oh, lifelong passion, starting with my father owning a 356 when we lived in Europe. And over the course of many years, I was fascinated by Porsche. I bought my first one in 1967. Wow. I was commissioned a second lieutenant in the Army, immediately spent most of my pay on a 911. <laughs> <laughs> Put it right back into the, Absolutely. Into the business. The fantasy came through true. Once uh, I had a career in um, photography and travel writing, I decided I wanted a career in automotive sales. Why? I picked up a new car at a dealership and they didn't help me. They said, here are the books to your car. Here are the keys. Said, right? This is a new 911. You're living your dream. You're oh, yes. Car. And they said, here are your keys. Here's the books. Uh, the car's out back. Like do it yourself? Yeah. Oh, that thought, was a different time. <laughs> I can do this so much better than that. Yeah. This is a dream. This is something people aspire to. And you want to make it fun and enjoyable for both the sales and the buyer. So that started. I said, I'm going to go do a better job than those guys. No, was that, was that just really kind of your take of it? Or, or was the franchise that you were working for was trying to turn that around too? This was the old days of car sales. Ah. You did not have customer satisfaction surveys. Oh. It was old, the old time, old fashioned, abusive sales. You're tactics. lucky we're selling a car to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, it's different when you're buying a Porsche than, say, a, a lower priced vehicle. Um, but it, the industry has changed significantly over the last 20, 30 years. Now the consumer really does have a wonderful experience, we try. Mm -hmm. um, 
much, much better than my first experience. Which and when you started, was uh, selling the Porsche in a specific Porsche dealership or were you selling other makes too? Because in the early days, Porsche was together with other, they didn't have yes. standalone dealerships, right? Virtually all the Porsche dealerships back then were dueled with Audi. Mm. So we had Porsche and Audi. Porsche could not support a single standalone dealership. We only had 928s. 944s and 911s and there wasn't enough volume nor profit to open a store so Audi supplemented that's so hard to yeah. understand nowadays where yeah. some of these Porsche dealerships today are oh. huge and yes. massive and state-of-the-art the mausoleum of the yeah. <laughs> so your first uh, dealership was uh, in Brumos was Brumos yes so that's pretty yeah. uh, iconic oh it was yeah well we opened Brumos Atlanta that's where I stayed um, we outsold the Florida store quite a bit. Um, bigger population, better demographic. Jacksonville versus Atlanta. So I didn't even realize there was. I didn't a, know either. There yeah. was a Brumos <laughs> Atlanta. Oh yeah, Did. you'll see Brumos Atlanta. Uh, I had no idea. That's oh, probably why you said in your email that you worked with Hurley Haywood when he would come in. Yes. And in my head, I'm thinking I thought he was always at the yeah. store in Jacksonville. Yeah. Well, Brian Redman ran the Atlanta store for quite a while. Oh. And it was so much fun working with a, with a man of his caliber, knowledge, uh, and quite frankly, the ability to tell a story. Sure. Oh, gosh. Oh. So b back then, or at, at what point, I mean, working together, selling a mark such as Porsche, but having people that race and having enthusiasts around you, that's got to be pretty, pretty cool. It is. Um, it was. Anyone who was big in the racing world at that time frequented the dealership. It was a club. It was a club of enthusiasts, racing drivers. We were sort of the factory outlet, if you will, for Porsche racing in the U.S. Um, I thought that's the way it was supposed to be. <laughs> Have fun with all the enthusiasts. Right. Sell cars and make money. So back then, how did they train you to sell Porsches? Or did they just expect you to do your own research and learn? You had book learning. Um, you had manuals that you studied. Um, very few videos or anything of that nature. Porsche has really upped their game over the last few years in training properly the salespeople. Um, you'll actually have events that you go to. Quite, quite nice, by the way. That was one of the benefits I loved more than anything about selling was going to the track, driving the cars on the track, taking that enthusiasm to help people buy their cars. I'd say, you've got to experience this. You'll love this. I know I just did it. So yeah. So here would be a great time to insert one of our uh, resident watchers. Hey, Ian, happy holidays. Um, over your decades of selling Porsches, was there a favorite model that you sold? And I, I think that's kind of a loaded question because we know <laughs> the, the model that runs through the decades, right? But was there a specific one of, the, of those models? One particular model? Yeah. <sighs> Well, of course, the, the supercars, the Carrera GT and the 918 Spiders, Ooh, okay. but those are so limited, and uh, I only sold one of each of those, so that's not, a, not really fair. The 911 is an icon. It's what brought me into the Porsche club, brought me into Porsche sales, so I had enthusiasm for the 911 particularly, and that enthusiasm is kind of contagious if you're selling them, so that... Any 911, um, anyone. Any one of them. And here's a question from Will Anthony. He, he thinks he, he's heard about a fact book. When, 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 when did that start? And <laughs> were you there when it started? Or yes, was I it was. before you? Oh, really? Okay. I still get calls and emails. Oh, careful. That makes noise. So. Texts from people uh, saying, do you have the fact book? Ah. And I have every single one from 1986 really? through the last year, which would have been probably 98, 99. No, take that back. Into the 2000s, 2004, 2005. A little white handbook. And you carried it in your, your right rear pocket. Every stat on every car. How many horsepower? How much did it cost? Really? What were the colors? I don't think Be I've ever before seen Google, this. Before Google, yeah. this is what you relied on. And you can buy these things at Swap Meets. Oh, it's, cool. it's a salesman's back book. Huh. I love those handbooks. I knew them from front to back. That was. Uh, so for someone, before we move on about salesmen, like for someone today that's yeah. looking to get into the Porsche world as a salesperson, any bits of advice for them? 
Um, yes, be prepared to work long hours. It takes time to build a clientele. Um, you should learn to sell a car. Selling a car, be it a Honda or a 911, uh, is the same process. It's selling a vehicle. You have paperwork to do, financing, for example. But you learn. You have to learn the process. The best way to do that is at a volume store. Go in and try selling at the Honda store, the Toyota store, the Kia dealership. Learn what the process is and see if you like it. If you like it, you go to the Porsche dealer and you say, I'm selling cars with one goal in mind. That's to become a Porsche salesman. Mm -hmm. So over, over the years, as um, consumers became more educated due to a laptop like this, and mm -hmm. they can Google all sorts of stuff, like how did that dynamic change for you with the relationship between someone that walked through the door in the 80s and 90s who didn't have as much mm -hmm. information at their fingertips, but now, I think they walk through the door knowing how much it costs and how much you make, how much the principal makes sure. and all that stuff. So yeah. how, how does that work? Very good question, Boo. It, um, it's changed, except there's not as much interpersonal reaction because the buyer is so knowledgeable by and large. Um, it's good, though, to have an educated buyer because you want the buyer, the buyer to be knowledgeable so that he makes sure that you're helping him, not misleading him giving him the right information, helping. Yeah, because the, uh, back in the uh, early 80s, the option list was nothing near oh, yeah. what it is today. Yeah. And just looking at a configurator today, you can go crazy because you hit one option and it wipes out another option. And, and, and we'll, go, we'll talk about this later on in the show about what options you should give cars. Yeah. But you really need a knowledgeable salesperson to help guide you through. Through the weeds, exactly. through the weeds, exactly. if you will. Yep. Yeah, that's absolutely correct, Manny. Um, it can be a daunting experience, even if you've done your homework. Um, on occasion, you even catch some bright sales guy who doesn't know it all. On occasion. There's so much to know, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so here's, here's my question for you. We talk, and Manny gets these calls a lot too, about colors and special editions and how my car's so super unique. But from a dealer, most dealerships that you go to, you'll see gray, white, black, and not not a full range of colors. Yes. And I've got to imagine that's because the ability to sell those versus selling a unique color. Well, now these times are different because of supply issues. Mm -hmm. So there isn't any inventory to go and pick a car. However, you have to stop and think that which color is going to sell, appeal to the most buyers. Mm. There may be one guy who wants the speed yellow one man who wants the cobalt blue, but there's always someone who will take a silver or a black or a white car. Seal gray, like, my, seal gray. Gray. like, like my car. <laughs> <Seal gray. laughs> yeah. But it, it's, it's difficult to order cars that are, have limited appeal. Yeah. We all love to see the great colors. I do, I'd go, oh man, yeah. paint a sample, look at that, I take pictures of them, True. they're wonderful. But as a practical business perspective, it takes longer to sell that there's one for every seat, but fewer for a cobalt blue, let's say. Yeah, and I guess that's just because of the, the buying habits of the American market versus in Europe where everybody comes in and builds their specific yeah. car and then they wait for it so they can get whatever yeah. color, whatever option. Here, you're trying to have a collection of cars available that appeals to as many people as possible so that you can turn them, right? Yes, however, times have changed, Vu. Right now, we are at the Porsche dealership level, they are dealing with an extremely limited inventory. Virtually everything is ordered. And my own particular client base, 90% of my clients did in fact order their cars oh. because they were more knowledgeable, had owned previously. New buyers need the help more than than the, the previous uh, clientele. Do you think this will change yes. the Americans' buying habit? Because yes. they're, then they're finally, you know what, maybe this is a good thing that I'm well, ordering my car. Oh, absolutely. And I get exactly what I want. It, Porsche it, used to come to us <laughs> and say, how can we get your members to order cars? Because in Europe, everyone orders cars, yeah. but the Americans want to go to their lot that night and pick up a car. And I would say, well, that's a mentality. You know, you want a Porsche. Exactly. Uh, Instant so, gratification. So, uh, to his question, uh, you think that's going to go back to the, the way it was, or will it be order 
It'll be order only. Yeah. And that applies across the automotive industry, quite frankly. The manufacturers and the dealers are discovering it's expensive to keep those cars physically on the sure. lot. Yep. And it's, much, it's, it's a better business model to have an order only and a smaller inventory for mm -hmm. those who some people always want that instant gratification. I want one now and I want that one. But yeah, it's changed. The pandemic and the supply chain shortages have dramatically changed the retail automotive yeah, industry. Porsche is opening up these boutique dealerships that yes. aren't really Pop dealerships. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. They're just little storefronts yes. uh, where you know you see the, see the uh, specs, you see the options. Yep. They're giving you an experience of what you help people with yes. in choosing uh, the options and then the order of the car. Yes, and that, that is the future. However, you have a dealer franchise body in the United States particularly, extremely strong politically and financially. So they will fight that. But the Tesla model, for example, there aren't Tesla dealerships. Eventually, you'll, I think that will be the automotive retail marketing strategy and business model. So you talked a little bit about supply issues, obviously with COVID and war and, and stuff. Uh, I've heard the numbers, I don't know where I heard it, but I believe in 2023, shortages of like 30% or so uh, supply. Depending upon the manufacturer and his supply chain, yeah. maybe even greater. Even greater? Yeah. yeah. Wow. It's a very delicate cycle, especially for Porsche. They have different suppliers all over Europe, um, and it's a fragile chain. One guy goes down, the man who makes self-dimming mirrors, for example. Uh. Well, suddenly we can't sell the car. It doesn't have its self-dimming rear view mirror. Uh, a seatbelt manufacturer has run out of material. You can't sell the car without a seatbelt. The weakest link so stops the production. The weakest link, absolutely. Wow. Yeah. So it's more complex than, than you might imagine on the surface. So, yep. So with, uh, along with supply, uh, a question here, volume dealerships trade cars with other dealerships. Does Porsche do that? Yes. They do? Okay. Yes. Because we have so, so a small number of vehicles available at any given time, you need to, you have to do that. So when you do that, does that mean that dealer that you traded with gets a percentage of the sale or is it just no, a swap of cars? It's a give and take. Okay. I call John Doe and say, John, I need that one you've got. What do you want in my inventory? And you cooperate. That's like a sports trade, right, Manny? <laughs> <laughs> Manny always it. makes fun of me. I know nothing about sports, but That's I tried what? to throw in a sports analogy there. You did good. You I did, did right? Good. Yeah, proper. <laughs> they call it DXing, dealer exchange. Dealer exchange. DX. Okay. Yeah. So let's talk about uh, advice from your side of uh, the, the, the table for someone that's coming in. Let's, let's, let's uh, approach new cars first. Okay. Uh, uh, someone walks through the door. What's your advice for someone buying a new Porsche? Do your homework, obviously, in advance. Know which model you want. Get an Thank idea you. of how, much, how many options you would like, what you think is your dream car. Then consult with a Porsche salesman or, quite frankly, Porsche Club members. I've, they're the most knowledgeable, independent people you'll find on advice. As 10 people, you get 10 different opinions, but get as much knowledge as you can, then let a professional help you. Um, I recall building my first 911 new, and I agonized over, what should I do? Should I buy the spoiler? Should I put leather here? Do I want power seats? And my wife said to me, would you stop agonizing and just get everything you want on it? Wow. And I said, Green oh light. boy, now I know how to order a Porsche. <laughs> <laughs> so do, do you recommend someone coming in to just check everything or, because I think most dealers, the cars that they stock is kind of like not the bear yeah. and also not the max. Again, I guess to keep the price reasonable, it's like yeah. moderately equipped. Yes, but there are some options that are worth the, the value you, you get. I would say sport exhaust, but that's Well, that's me. my personal opinion too. <laughs> Always I mean, get sport exhaust. Without question. Yeah. However, there are people who want quieter cars. Um, I like a full leather interior. Mm. Took me a long time to adjust to that. The smell costs more. Is yeah. it that important to you to have full leather? Transmission, do you want a manual? Mm. Do you want a PDK? Do you want a particular color? Do you want different wheels? Talk about confusing the buyer. 
Look at the number of wheels available. Oh, yeah. You cannot possibly order every car with the right combination as a dealer. Each individual must specify what he wants. Now, how did you handle that? Because I know in sales, I learned quickly, the worst thing you can do is give a customer a choice. Oh, absolutely. Because they won't decide, they won't oh, they, they'll have to go home and think about it. <laughs> so it's almost where you have to tell them what they yeah. want. But well, yeah. you just brought up the wheels, which never occurred to me. Yeah. Yes, there's a lot of choices yeah. of wheels. Yeah. And, and how do you address that? Uh, do you just pick a couple of wheels you think the customer is going Well, you like? find out what is selling nationwide, mm. what is on the ads, what's in the, in the car magazines. Um, and you, you narrow it down to making it acceptable. And cost also. Some wheels, let's say a Cayenne with the 18-inch wheels, well, someone says, I want the 21s. Well, the price difference is, is dramatic. Five times more for two inches of tire and wheel? Mm, maybe you might reconsider. But here, here's one for you. That, and I was just about, but right before you saying that, was you know, nowadays wheels are 20, 21, 22 inches. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody coming from, let's say, uh, another brand that probably has 18 inch or 19 inch wheels, they, they, of course they look at it and they think it's beautiful, but they might not understand that when they hit a bump, yeah. a big, a big wheel and a small, small uh, tire sidewall. wall, sidewall, yeah. and also when it comes time to replace those tires, those yeah. tires are way more expensive than an 18 inch wheel. So do you tell your customers that when they start yeah. saying, oh, I want a 22 because they think it looks cool? Positively. Yeah. Um, a lot of people will opt for an aftermarket wheel, which may cost a third or even less than the factory Porsche. The problem is unsprung weight. Mm. Most of our members know about unsprung weight. Aftermarket wheels typically weigh so much. Imagine putting cinder blocks on all four wheels and weighing the car down. That's why the Porsche lighter alloys or decent aftermarket wheels, the BBSs, mm. as an example. Yeah. Um, you have to tell people that, yeah, you hit a pothole in the, an urban environment and it may crack the wheel entire. One of the only things I ever recommended people buy as an after sale accessory, because dealers love to sell you rust and dust or mm. fabric protection. Well, buy a wheel and tire protection plan. Um, it may cost you $2,500. I have a friend, Mr. Gregory Brown, that has taken advantage of that. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just calling him out. That was the sound of a bus running over Gregory. <laughs> <laughs> he bought that plan, and that's paid four times at least. I can personally attest to having lost two wheels and tires yeah. on the 14th Street Bridge the day after Christmas. That's tenure. where he lives. <laughs> and it paid for my wheel and tire warranty. Thank you very yeah, much. That More is good. probably very true with, yeah. like Bruce said, the uh, low-profile oh. tires and the 21-inch wheels yeah. and uh, and whatnot. Uh, what about uh, stuff like, uh, we talked about uh, paint the sample. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, is that something that, uh, if uh, I look at the price of how much it's gonna cost me, mm -hmm. is that something you, get, you feel you get back when you sell the car, or you trade it in? Not always. Yeah. Um, you'll find that uh, colors come out of favor, in and out of favor. Right now, paint the sample is a big deal. Hot, yeah. It's also very expensive, and Porsche, if you'll note, has taken paint to sample and tripled the price in a very short period of time. It's profitable, it makes people happy. I personally, and, and I'm sure you guys, love to see some of these colors. They're beautiful, they're expensive. Will the buyer get his money back at the end? He'll probably have to wait quite a bit longer to, to find that right that. person. Yes. Yeah. The right person yeah. that wants Ruby Star. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. That will pay off whatever. And you get the right person, they'll yeah. pay for it. Oh, yes, but dearly. You have to wait. But it may take you a long time. Yeah. So it's a trade off like anything else. But there are some beautiful colors out there now. Just. Uh, so, speaking of like w must, must haves, and, and this will transition a little bit over to CPO. Yeah. Like, I, I've always been a big fan of CPO, you know, buying obviously through a Porsche dealership and having them go through the list and you know warranty the car very similar to a new car but in fact nowadays um, a, a buddy of mine Paul Gentili I'll, I'll drop your name because I know you're watching <laughs> so he got a CPO yeah. Macan S added like two years so now he has like a six-year warranty yes. Uh, and uh, was it uh, no mileage limitations? That's yes. like incredible. Yes. If my only advice to buying a pre-owned car, a used, 
you you should buy a CPO car from a Porsche dealer. I think that's a fantastic deal. It is, yes. It, it's a six year from the original sale of the vehicle with unlimited mileage. That's... It can in many times be better than a new car warranty. It covers the same bumper to bumper. It, uh, it's the way to buy a, a... But not every car used car in a Porsche dealership is CPO. Yes. Maybe you can explain yeah. why that is. If it is not, you must ask, why is this car not certified? Sometimes it will be... <clears throat> excuse oh, will me. Qual qualify as a CPO? Oh, yes, some oh, do not. Okay. Okay. If the car has had paint work done on two adjoining panels, it will not qualify. Oh. If it has a bad car fax, it will not qualify. If the service history is suspect, it won't qualify. Mm. So you you know that if a car has not been CPO'd, there is a reason for it. Mm. And it does cost the dealer money to certify the car. They inspect and then they pay to have that warranty put on the car. It is the best, most secure, and I call it a security blanket. Yeah, um, especially in today's cars with so much just the electrical stuff that's inside a modern day Porsche or any car for that matter, yeah. to have that warranty is a nice peace of mind. Yes, and it's valid nationwide. Every Porsche dealer in the country will, will accept that warranty. Oh, that's that's a uh, perfect question here from uh, Gurney Eagle 500. What should your expectations for service from a local dealer when you purchase the car from an out-of-state dealer? Let's say you moved from one state to another yeah. and you bought it, had the full warranty. Can you expect that your local dealer will take care of you like where you bought from or mm. as if you bought from them? That is a very good question. That, who is he, Dan Gurney? Uh, Gurney Eagle 500. Gurney Eagle he's, 500. He's, huh? he, he watches us quite a bit. <laughs> um, it is service costs and charges are by market, whatever the market will bear. Mm. Um, I have, for example, a 30,000 mile service on a 911 in Colorado was m less expensive than one in Florida by a significant amount. What, can the, what will the market bear? Um, you need to shop, you need to price, you need to negotiate sometimes. The, but if, the, if your car is still under warranty, can oh, you expect the local dealer to oh, still Oh, positively, warranty? absolutely, okay. without question. I guess because the, my experience is the service department manager is different than the sales manager. Yeah. Service department manager is looking for his income too. So oh, if he sure. sees a new customer who's bringing in a car that he can service uh, under warranty and continue maybe, he'll be more than happy to bring him in, right? Oh, without question, yes, absolutely. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, the CPO, uh, I think, is like the, the best way to buy a Porsche because it gives you incredible peace of mind. I know you can buy aftermarket warranties, yeah. but uh, at least, I don't know if these still are, but for the longest time, Porsche had the highest rated uh, pre-owned warranty, or like CPO yes. warranty in the industry. Yes. And much like you had mentioned before about the surveys and whatnot, <laughs> they yeah. keep the dealers on their toes. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very um, uh, cognizant of the surveys for the uh, CPO warranties that everyone's happy. Yes. And, uh, and, and, and how they look at the cars and how they evaluate them. But I still tell people that if you're buying a CPO car, don't think it's just been blessed by magic fairy dust and you don't have to do any due diligence. You still have to treat it like a used car and, yes. and have it looked at and yeah. check it out, but uh, know that it has a very good peace of mind warranty. Yes. I would also point out that the uh, CPO um, from Porsche is, without question, the best investment you can make in buying a pre-owned car. However, if you're buying from a non-dealer, let's say member, Porsche club member to a Porsche club member, um, you have to have faith and confidence and trust in the fact that the car has been well cared for and the seller does say, look, I've serviced it, here are my receipts, here's the old fashioned book stamp. But I would caution a buyer to make sure you have full documentation. Mm -hmm. Don't, for example, have a guy, a seller say, oh yeah, we replaced the IMS bearing. Oh, it's been done, don't worry. Fine, show me yeah, the paperwork. Yeah. Well, I lost the paperwork. Okay, walk away, go somewhere else. Yeah. Unless everything can be documented, be suspicious. So what about like, um, well, I, hopefully you're comfortable in answering this one. Like there's, <laughs> big, there's big chains that also buy, say Porsches from auctions and they offer um, uh, also a warranty with it, but they're not a Porsche dealer. They sell all types of cars. Mm -hmm. Like those, those warranties, 
because Porsches are so specialized, do those cars end up going back to a dealership or do they have some third party service those cars? Well, that, that's where certified becomes a blanket. Uh, yeah, we certify this car yeah. is pre-owned. Well, right. the Porsche certifi certified warranty, the CPO, is exclusive to a Porsche dealership. Mm. Joe Blow, the Mercedes store, no one can put a certified pre-owned warranty uh, except a Porsche dealer. I see, I see. Each individual dealer may offer an aftermarket warranty. Mm -hmm. um, Lexus is a good one. They, they will put a warranty on a Porsche that they're selling, mm -hmm. but it's not, it's not the, the same. same. Thing. It's not the same. It's not the same. And and I, you know, I my car, my 996 came with an aftermarket warranty, which you know, whatever. Um, and it wasn't that great because it had all sorts of stipulations. Yeah. It had like a um, almost like a copay. Mm -hmm. And then the I took my car to the dealer um, to get it serviced, and they hated working with that that third party warranty because they had to the call and explain and the hours that they had oh, were different yeah. from the hours from the dealership and they had to like go back and forth and then at the end of the day they have to like ask for a credit card and so just so for those of you that are considering aftermarket warranties just in full disclosure do your homework because they're not yes. they're not the same yep. yeah from a franchise dealer of a major manufacturer Typically, those are, are decent warranties. Mm. Not all, but the majority of them are. Mm. But be very careful of the independent companies you've never heard of. Yeah. They typically are aftermarket. The one that calls your cell phone at like midnight? <laughs> the, the, the same one that we, yeah. No, no, don't touch them with a 10-foot yeah. pole. Um, now, one of the things I always tell people who are telling me they're going to buy a new Porsche is to consider European delivery. Uh, or even uh, PEC delivery, which is yes. at the Atlanta or uh, L.A., uh, uh, Porsche Experience Center. What, yeah. what are your thoughts on that or did you experience that have experience with that? Yes I would strongly urge anyone buying a new Porsche to pick it up in Germany if failing that pick it up at PEC Atlanta That's the Porsche Experience Center Atlanta mm -hmm. or PEC LA. Mm -hmm. It is the way to go um, It makes the car so much more the, the event so much more enjoyable memorable um, You also get to drive the car on the track in Europe, you get to go on the Autobahn, although it's congested now, but you can still take that car up to 160, 170 in spots. On the track at PECLA or Atlanta, you can drive the car with an instructor, not yours, their car, same model. I firmly believe AG and most of like PECLA and, and Atlanta undersells that because if people truly knew how amazing that experience is, they, they probably already are book solid, but it would just be worse well, because it is such a special experience that yes, if you're buying a new car, take the plunge and do a European delivery yeah. or take a PEC Atlanta or LA delivery. Well, I'll, I'll make a quote, small confession. Most dealers do not like the process. Oh. It is, it's paperwork intensive. It, your, the profit margin is less. So the dealer, for the car or for the package? For the, for the car. Really? The dealer pays $4,000 plus oh, yeah. for a European delivery. So the dealers don't want to do the paperwork. It, once you've learned to do the paperwork, it's easy. Yeah. But it's, it's your passport. It's you pay for it in advance. You insure. It's not an easy thing to do. Um, but if you really wanted to be a true service person to your customer oh, take that extra effort well the configurator it says on there yes. delivery oh. it's not, not hard to find it yeah. says they ask you how do you want to deliver yes okay and i made a big deal out of that with a lot of my clients i'd say you want the best you're going to go to europe next year wait till next year get the porsche european delivery it makes it so memorable mm -hmm. from a, uh, a business perspective i can't tell you the number of clients that i had who became clients for life based on their experience that I gave. They think I gave it to them. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. But it, it's the way to go, if at all possible. It's, it's a wonderful way to go. And uh, the more downscale version is just like you said, PEC, yes. where you still get the grand tour sure. of the experience still center. very special. You get the oh, track, yeah, you get, yeah. I think, lunch or dinner there. Absolutely. And then yeah. you're, on, you're on your way to uh, drive home. To drive home. Yep. <laughs> a quick question from Mark Richburg. Should you still ask the dealer for a copy of the CPO inspection report, just like you would for a PPI? Positively, yes. Okay. It will be given. 
um, each technician, when they inspect the car, yeah. has a th th four-page checklist <coughs> um, that is to accompany the car. Yeah. On rare mm -hmm. occasions, it may not accompany that day, but it, it, is, it absolutely must be provided, okay. and each dealer will have that, and each technician has it. So yes to his question. So here's a question for you. Yeah. You know, we all have access to cars all over the country, all over the world for right. that matter. Right. You see a car that you like in the West Coast, and we're here in the East Coast. It's a CPO car. Yeah. Do you buy it sight unseen? Yes. Oops. Really? <laughs> that was too quick a response. Really? If it is a franchise. I have, I have to like touch it and feel it and sit in it. Well, I know. that That's a, a kind of an outdated. I know. I, I know the feeling, I know. because, I, you know, this is a major investment. But you trust the system that much that you would buy the car? Yes. You really? Have, when you're buying from a franchise dealer, the advantage is you have, you have recourse. You can give the car back to them if it's not as was represented. They know, a, a franchise dealer knows that he must sell something as represented. Are, are there mistakes in that? Does occasionally one slip through the tracks? Yes, mm. but it's, it's incredibly rare. Mm. I would, my son bought his 996 911 Turbo, not from his not dad. Not from his dad. <laughs> he, bought it, he bought it as a CPO car out of Texas. Flew down, picked the car up, and drove it back. Came home and had an ear-to-ear -ear grin. Good for and him. I looked at the car and went, yeah, I want one of those. <laughs> so I think the key there is you said franchise dealers, which means a Porsche dealership. Yes, yes. So uh, someone who's looking at a uh, Panamera and is being sold at an Infinity dealer mm -hmm. on their used car lot, and the Infinity dealer looked it up and found out there's six months left on the warranty and says, hey, it has six months left on the Porsche CPO warranty. Uh, the difference being there is that that dealer did not inspect that used car. That CPO car was inspected at one time, but that could have been two years ago, yes. and a lot could have happened. The car could have been in a wreck. Yep. It could have had a lot of damage done to it. So yes, you're getting the warranty, but you're not getting the inspection where it passed a certain level, uh, certain yep. minimum standards be able to be yep. considered. Um, many dealers, most, if you give them the vehicle identification number, they can tell you when the car was placed in service, what warranty remains, um, and they'll do that as a courtesy. So, so wh where are the dealers primarily getting their used cars from? Are they buying from their customers? Are they buying it wholesale? Or, I mean, currently, yeah, anywhere they can find them. Yeah. Uh, calling clients, uh, going online, uh, auctions. That there's just nothing out there. It's improving slightly, slowly but surely. But it's not going to get better overnight. And when those cars come in, let's say it's been lowered or has aftermarket exhaust, I assume the dealership wants everything put back to stock? To, in order to be certified pre-owned, a CPO car must have oh. original wheels, must have original oh. exhaust, must be brought up to Porsche spec. But you can bring it back and then oh, CPO yeah. as opposed to saying yes. no because it has. Well, if you trade in a car that has a lot of modifications, yeah. like yeah. let's say they, you trade your 996 in, uh, um, Porsche will much. <laughs> <laughs> Porsche would go in, spend twelve hours taking all your modifications out, and because uh, I had a friend of mine who worked at a Porsche dealer as a uh, technician, and every uh, every April for the uh, swap meet, uh, Porsche swap meet, he would bring all these parts. Oh yeah. And basically, he took yes. them off, and, just and the dealer said, "Just get rid yeah. of them because we yeah. can't use them because it's aftermarket exhaust, oh. aftermarket wheels." And he would have all this truckload of stuff oh, yeah. that he took off that they then had to pay to put yeah. the. Uh, yeah. um, so when you buy a CPR car, a CPO car, and I've had this experience, uh, you know, I looked at a car and I said, "Well, you know, I really want CPO. Can you CPO this car?" And the salesman said, "Well, it's going to cost an extra five thousand yeah. dollars." because that's what it cost us to CPO yes. it. So don't be surprised, it's not yeah. the salesman just BSing you. No, he's not trying to make, he's not taking advantage. Those aftermarket wheels must be pulled off. And unless, stock wheels put in, or, or stock mm -hmm. exhaust. Or. Unless they're a, a, an approved wheel or an approved sound system, an approved exhaust system, and there aren't many. It's, sure. 90% is approved. My Porsche. cars would never go through CPO. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I told you time would fly, so I want to keep going through the agenda. Let's talk about coming to the table and negotiating. How much room is there for negotiations? In today's market, I almost kind of feel like 
Yeah. There isn't, but well, truly is there. The, the f one overwhelming perspective is that any price negotiation, be it in a short supply or an oversupply, a negotiation is not supposed to be an antagonistic. It's, not, it's supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be the, the dealer making a profit, the seller making a profit, the buyer being, a, being happy with the amount of discount he's being given. Um, it, it's, it's not a, an adversarial uh, thing. It's supposed to be fun. Now, in a given situation like we have now, you've got no inventory. So if the dealer doesn't have any inventory to sell, he's not making any money. Yeah. He is going to charge what the market will bear. Is it fair? Yeah, nobody likes to pay over sticker. Mm -hmm. I'm the first one. Yeah. No, but I got to have that dealer open his doors. So there must be some market equilibrium. Yeah. Right now, supply is way, way under demand. Right. Econ 101, yeah. price goes we up. Talk, we talked yeah. about that earlier, and someone mm -hmm. asked on, in here about ADM. And I, I'm with you. It's like, I totally get it. When you have less things to sell, but you still have all the lights, you have the building, you have all the staff, and the market's willing to pay the ADM, you'd be silly. Yeah. I mean, I get it. Like, you, 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 the business model has to be that way. $200,000 over sticker? Yeah, yeah, that's a bit greedy. Yeah. But ADM, I think there is, there's a place for it. There, there is, certainly. I mean, that, that's Econ 101 yeah. again. Um, there are some dealers who are greedy. There are businessmen who are greedy. Um, if you have a working relationship with a particular dealer or a particular salesman, then you'll find that it's a mutual back scratch. I'll give you this, and that's all I can give you, but we value your business. We want you to buy again. The guy who pays 100000 over sticker is not going to come back to that dealer, oh. period. You've, you've taken advantage of me. I'm not coming back. You know, that, that's it's the reality. It's a short-term game. Short -term it's a short -term, term. Exactly. So uh, yes. along those lines, in this, this economy that we're in now, um, so when you go to trade a car in, yeah. that was also part of the stress of buying a car because you felt like you were getting low-balled on your trade-in. Mm -hmm. Is it now because inventory is so low that the dealer is going to be more competitive uh, in buying your, your, your uh, trade-in? Absolutely. Why? He has no inventory. The dealer needs your... You are a seller when you trade your car. I, John Jones, am selling you trading. I'm selling you my car, and I know what the market is because I've done my homework. You, Mr. Dealer, have to stand up and pay for this car. So the dealer wants it. He's going he's gonna to pay you a fair price unless he's one of that one percenter out there who, does, who tries to take advantage. But the market is so well known these days because of the internet. One caution, because it says on NADA, because it says on Kelly, Kelly, Blue, <coughs> Kelly Blue Book or something. Yeah, that, those are guides as to oh. the value of a vehicle. The, the market does vary between uh, geographic regions. A uh, four-wheel drive truck in Colorado's Rocky Mountains is worth more there than it is in Atlanta, Georgia. They don't care about four-wheel drive there. They do in Colorado. Yeah. So there are market differences. It's a good, strong guide, though, and the Internet is wonderful for that. So under negotiation on, in a normal economy, and I have right. to preface that because, yes, like please. you said, right now yeah. we're not in a normal economy. But back <clears> when we were in a normal economy, and uh, I was always told that the uh, four-door portions were the easiest to negotiate. They could get a discount. 911s don't expect anything. Boxer Caymans, it depends on how, what options they had and which model it was. Uh, by and large, yes. Yeah. Supply, demand. Um, however, um, the, the inventory of vehicles is the, the determiner, the demand for the vehicles. Um, 911s are non-existent right now. You just cannot. You, there's a long, long waiting list. Um, I would guess at this point, if you want a base 911, uh, 18 months to two years wait. Wow. So wow. It, will it improve? Yes. But it's going to take time. All right. So since you brought up yeah. the word list, <laughs> yes. we all know and hear about these lists that dealers yes. have. And more importantly, allocations. Tell me some insight on that and how that all works in the dealership. And world. by the way, P 
PCA does not control allocations. I wish we did because we would, I would triple take, our I membership. I would take bribes like there's no tomorrow, <laughs> like a corrupt we politician. We do not have any allocations. <laughs> we wish we did. None. We do not. None. So how does the dealership handle that? Um, each dealer is given an allocation by model. For example, one month in a normal economy, uh, we'll get the average dealership gets three 911s, four Cayennes, two Macans, and it's by your turn rate. Last year, you, Mr. Dealer, sold a lot. We're going to reward you with more. more uh. You're going to improve your facility. You're going to build a brand new dealership. We're going to give you a bunch of really good allocations. The allocations are, of course, restricted because Porsche can only build so many cars. An allocation is worth its weight in gold. Mm. Um, how do you get a good one? How do you get a hard-to-get car? You develop a relationship with a dealership, with a salesperson at that dealership who has been there for a while, someone that is recommended by a fellow Porsche club member. The, the PCA, our members, are a wealth of knowledge, uh, how to buy, where to buy. Um, that's, I used to give talks uh, monthly at, every, at a Porsche club meeting and give the latest information. And it paid me, and, and paid me back so well People said, go buy from Mike Maurer. Mm. He's one of us. He, and it, it PCA membership, great so, people. So is there an understanding with your, you know, people that are at the top of the list that have these or that receive these allocations that if they buy these cars from you that they don't just flip them and or you get first right of refusal or anything like that? Um, gentlemen's agreements. You get first right of refusal, the dealership okay. does. Okay. And this is in today's market with GT3s, um, GT3 RSs, any of the GT cars particularly. Yeah. A gentleman's agreement, there, there is no hard and fast legal agreement. You buy the car, it's your personal property. But you can do with it what you want to. The quickest way to get off the list is oh, to flip yes. it. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, in a yeah. heartbeat. Yeah. And the, the world is, uh, I know. monitor bring a trailer and I'm not, at a dealership oh. anymore. But I watched bring a trailer, these guys buying a car, 22 miles, and they make $100,000. Oh. The dealers have immediately taken that guy off their list, immediately. So you're on a blacklist. So does that oh, mean, yeah. I've had dealers tell me that they prefer, and some will not sell to an out-of-towner. They want someone who's going to come back to them, either bring the car back to resell, and they want a relationship. Yes. They want that person yes. local to stay. Yeah. And, Oh, yeah. Which they don't get. Once they sell the car to somebody halfway across the country, they'll never see that car again. Or, they, or maybe the customer. Um, that is true, was true, more than it is now. At this point in time, the dealer will sell to any, the highest bidder. They don't want to, but you know, you're, in, you're in business and you've got something that someone wants. Yeah, yeah we would sell literally internationally. Um, Sold a 911 Cabriolet to a guy in Paris. And I said, the one thing I want is a picture of this car near the Eiffel Tower. Uh, and he did. He, did, he sent he got me a it. picture of, with, the, with the dealership tag bracket on it in front of the Eiffel Tower. So, uh, but Great. yeah, yes. So let's talk about some of the <laughs> mistakes you've seen people have made purchasing a Porsche over the years. On new cars, the mistakes that are made is they, they don't put enough optional equipment on a car. Um, or the opposite, they put too much onto a car. You can spend, as we all know, a fortune in Porsche options. Mm -hmm. They're expensive and there are laundry lists of options. So hit the middle ground and talk to friends, talk to, to people who own Porsche, talk to Manny, talk to Vu, talk to me. Um, and, and reach a happy medium. And something can be said, you know, get what you want, but yeah, there's a smart way to do it too. I guess you look at the exclusive list of options, and yeah. uh, you know, we've seen the cars where the leather mm -hmm. vents or vents are covered in leather, exactly. everything's covered in leather. Uh, yeah. You may not get back what you put into it, unless you find someone who loves leather as <laughs> much as you do, I can. Uh, versus <laughs> if you were to get PASM yeah. or, or sport exhaust. <clears throat> or, or a better stereo option, which uh, more people would find desirable. Well, what will happen is when that car is <clears throat> traded or becomes a pre-owned vehicle, 
the buyer who gets that car gets a huge bonus. He gets all of that, and he's not paying for it. Uh, Which is just really quick uh, before I want to stay on this topic of uh, mistakes, but uh, what are your thoughts on, on the subscription options? Now, now, you're retired before Porsche did this, but BMW, I think, has already started. Where Porsche? the heated seats are like good for a couple years, and you got to pay again. Uh, well, pardon my French, but that's greed. Mm. I'm sorry, that's a model where the manufacturers are not making enough gross profit on the sale of cars. And person, it's because everything is available to the buyer. So the dealers and the, and the manufacturers trying to turn a profit, scratch, let's, let's charge for heated seats. A subscription model. Yeah. Just like the software on your laptop. Oh, it's exactly exactly what it is. It's, yeah. it's a big yeah. topic in right now yeah. in the industry of yes. uh, will, will customers accept that? Because as you said, it's a very high profit margin. Porsche buyers, the ones that I know, and I've sold about 2,000 plus cars, the poor average Porsche buyer will say, no way, yeah. <laughs> I'm not paying for that. I'll figure out a different way. I'm, yeah. Porsche won't do it. They, they'll learn from the others. Right, you know so what? There's, there's one thing that we didn't talk about, leasing, and when is uh, that a good idea? <clears throat> it's a good idea in most cases these days, particularly amongst the electric vehicles. The Taycan, for example, or any electric vehicle, you buy a Tesla. The technology is very rapidly changing. Mm. In order to protect yourself against obsolescence, lease the vehicle. After three years, you can say, hmm, the new technology is so far superior to the three-year-old car I'm driving. Boy, am I glad I leased it. I can turn it in and get the newest one. Or conversely, you know, the new ones aren't all that much better. I'm happy. I like this car. You can I, still buy it. I now. can buy it because when I, when I leased it, they said at the end, your residual value is what you can buy the car for. And in some cases, you can make money. And I think programs today, the residual is like very competitive of you just financed it. Like back in the, when leasing first came about, I think yes. the leasing model wasn't really advantageous to the consumer. Yes. But today's leasing programs, yes. you can make out pretty darn well. Yeah. And the residuals are reasonable. It's as if you had financed the car from the beginning. Well, it's a win-win, generally speaking. Yeah. As a dealer, the dealer wants you to buy a car and at three years, he wants you to come back when the lease is up and he can sell you another one where you might not get rid of that car after three years or four years or five. So this way, he's pretty much guaranteed you're going to come back and say, you know what, Mr. Dealer, I want the new one or um, I'm going to buy this one. Can you certify it for me? The dealer will say, "Ah, Manny, we'll be happy to take the car off lease, run it through our shop give it a certification, now you've got a CPO used car. It's a great way to go. Sure. So, yes, leasing 99% of the time is the best way to go. I think we still have a few more of the uh, mistakes not to make. Yep, go ahead. I think Robert had a Robert graphic. had the mistakes. Huh? Graphic. There, there we go. go. Uh. Don't buy the least expensive Porsche. How many times have we said this yes. to people <laughs> yes. when they call? And, and uh, I, that's probably more... More so with the uh, pre-owned models that uh, and we we say that all the time on in, in advertisements in the mart. And I'm sure you had uh, people who said, "Well, I can buy a car this cheap," but yes. I always say that's a, that's the least expensive part of the whole ownership process. Absolutely and positively, yes, that's a, yep. Yeah. Don't believe that these cars never break down. Well, rarely do they ever break. <laughs> so, you know, that's something where uh, um, make sure they're maintained. Positive. Yeah, look for maintenance records. Yes. Look for uh, have someone look at the car if yeah. you're buying pre-owned. Obviously, you don't, you don't want to just take the word that they don't break down. Don't worry about it. Uh, they're uh, bulletproof. Yeah. This is more so for, for new Porsche buyers who... Uh, the first time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I also think is important is to set their expectations. Someone coming from... A Camry or a Lexus, maybe, or something that's not used to having 21 inch wheels and tires. <laughs> Guess what? When you go to replace that stuff, it's going to be more expensive than yes. you know, your standard Goodyear that you had on your, on your Acura. One little bit of advice um, something called a wheel and tire insurance policy yes. <laughs> is something that I would advise all Porsche owners to buy. Um, you can 
take it on any car, go to the local dealer and say, I want to buy a Porsche wheel and tire warranty. And there's a, a cooling off period. It's about six, I think, six weeks, six months. But it, you can buy that oh, you can for add your it? car, your car. Now how, car. Uh, something yeah. like that, something like uh, a ceramic coating, right. the add-ons, I call them. Yeah. Uh, how negotiable are those items? Um, the wheel and tire is pretty much set by okay. Porsche. Um, $10, $15 negotiation. Um, ceramic, it's, that's a new technology, relatively speaking. Mm -hmm. Porsche is now offering uh, PPF. Uh, Paint protection yeah, film. All that, yeah. yeah. Uh, my personal advice is to do it through your local dealer who will have a, an installer who is an expert at it. Um, negotiable, somewhat, but not, not tremendously negotiable because the, the third party, the guy who's installing it, he has margins to make too. Sure. So you're getting it at a wholesale price um, better than going directly to that installer. But yeah, PPF, uh, I guess ceramic. if you get PPF for the dealer, if there's an issue, they come back to the dealer and then the dealer talks to the installer, so you're not left out in the wind. Uh. Well, I can speak for several dealers who have an installer and the, the installer himself will honor the warranty. Um, it's five-year warranty typically on even stone chips. Uh, mm. so, but it, you must go through the dealer for someone to have recourse to go back to. You know. Can I ask this question? This is a little bit different from the common mistakes, but I thought this was a good one. Uh, and again, hopefully you're comfortable with it. So let's say you track your GT car. Does it lose its value than a non-tracked car? Mm. <laughs> I mean, that's what they were meant to do. Um, yeah, I guess it's the yeah. condition of the car? Um, it, it depends on the buyer. It depends on the car. It, it depends on, on the sales world at that point in time. Most people understand that you can track a GT3. Yeah. Um, and it does not hurt the car. Sure, you've got to place tires and, and brakes. Make sure there's no over revs. And over revs, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know that it... It doesn't hurt the car as much as it did, say, 10, 15 years ago. A tracked car was like, ooh, let's not go there. I know now people buying cars that have been tracked pretty heavily. It does affect the resale value somewhat. They are less expensive because of the track exposure, but not, not a huge amount. And I think a lot of those buyers are they're going to they're gonna track it anyway. Exactly. So they're like, yeah. let me take advantage of this yep. little dip yep. in potential yep. uh, price, and yep. I'm going to be using it the way it should be. Exactly. Uh, yeah. I, before we, I can't let you go before you tell us a story <laughs> about uh, when uh, we were talking about at dinner time uh, G about GT3s and allocations and how that's like gold, like Willy Wonka's golden ticket if you can get a GT3 yeah. allocation. But you told us a story at a dealer you were fortunately you worked at where uh, you made some people very happy. Yes. Um, at almost every Porsche dealer in the nation, there are the select few clients who get all of the GT cars. They're the, the favored buyers. And a few years ago, uh, Frank Donatoni, who was my general manager, and I decided it would be a good thing to sell a GT3 to a guy who walked in the dealership, didn't have a history of ownership, but was a true enthusiast. And it was, it was really decent because the buyer was so shocked and amazed that he got a GT3, and we made somebody extremely happy. However, in the long run, what happened, uh, probably 60 to 70% of those people flipped the car for a profit. Oh, oh. And the other 30% became clients for life and true dedicated Porsche files. So it's a double-edged sword. Um, but by and large, them what has gets, unfortunately. Yeah. That's so. a cool, that was, when you told us, that was a cool story for sure. I would strongly suggest if you want a, a GT3 or an RS or hard to get, you develop a long-term relationship with a dealership, be it the general manager, or a long-term Porsche sales guy, someone who's been there, knows the business, knows the cars, and it's a it's member Porsche club. Yeah, it's about the people. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, and, and and another point about the whole GT3. Everybody wants a GT3. Everybody yeah, wants yeah, a yeah. GT3, yeah. right? 
But what if a customer came into you and you knew that they typically drove, you know, a standard 911 or they came something came from something that's more of a touring car, but they just wanted GT3 because, well, it's the hottest car. Like, do you give them a heads up? Like, it rides a little bit stiffer than a normal oh, yes. 911, yeah. right? That, that's your duty, if you will, to, yeah. to inform a, a prospective buyer. Um, it, it's amazing the number of people who want, quote unquote, the best, the fastest, yeah. the most desirable, without having any knowledge whatsoever of what that means. Even the older cars. We've had several air-cooled, older 80s, 911s, and people will come in and say, oh, I want one of those, right? Oh, man, this is the car I want. You let them drive, let's say, a G50 transmission, an 87, 88, 911. Which is pretty reasonable. Yeah. yeah. So they drive down the street and they try and make a U-turn. And then <laughs> they figure out that, <laughs> and they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they try to put the clutch in, they go, oh my God. They don't understand. Right. And it, it's, it behooves. They'll learn to appreciate it, but right then and there, they're like, what am I getting myself yes. into? Yeah. So, you know, drive before you buy. That's absolute. Now, you can't buy a GT3 and drive it. Yeah. People don't understand that. Well, we can sell, we, the dealer, can sell 10 times the number of GT3s or GT cars, and there aren't those cars to drive. Right. Unless. You go to PC, PEC ATL or LA their drive and, and do a, a driving program. Yeah. If you're that serious, go Definitely. drive That's one first. That's a great first. idea. Yep. And it's fun. <coughs> it's like an amusement park in my estimation. Go down there and just drive cars <coughs> on the track. It's so. better than any test drive you're going to get on the oh, street. Positively, oh, yeah. yeah. No speeding tickets? I mean, hey. <laughs> well, there you have it. I told you an hour would go by super no, quick. No. A couple of housekeeping items. No. Uh, the classic club coupe shoes there's still a few pairs left so if you haven't uh if you didn't get a pair under uh, your tree then uh, maybe just order one for yourself at porschedesign.com we also have the pca club plow uh the roadster the carry-on uh works reunion amelia island march 3rd uh judged cars have sold out we still have room for um, half, the, uh, corral half of the oh, half of the corral is sold out oh. But we will love to, to see you there. Uh, Treffin, uh, Georgia Mountains, registration opens January 4th, I believe. Mm -hmm. And that one, as you know, all of our Treffins sell out very quickly. And they're doing a tour to PEC Atlanta. They are. Ooh. They are. And uh, so if you're interested in going there, read about all the options now. And then on January 4th, be ready, be on your computer as soon as it opens because it will sell out very quickly. And back on the uh, schedule, I'm happy to announce that Tech Tactics East, we're gonna be back at Easton uh, February 18th and 19th. Registration opens January 18th. So looking forward to going and up for there. For those that can't make it physically, we're gonna do a recording a lot of the episodes mm -hmm. yep. to show on uh, this channel. Absolutely, and then also recently dropped several videos on YouTube, please click subscribe for us. That really helps our algorithms and makes our channel a success. We also posted the uh, most recent PCA Porsche Club Insider podcast, number 42, Manny. The Love Boat episode. <laughs> the, the Love Boat episode. And it's our one year the anniversary of the podcast. So have a listen. Wow. Folks, that's all. Happy New Year. And uh, we'll catch you next time. Uh -huh. <laughs> Wonderful. That was a great time.